So once again, we've got a very diverse panel here. And once again, these are all great people that we've had the pleasure of working with that in one way, shape or form have definitely helped advance our careers. So, you know, what? without further ado, let's start with, um, if, again, if you guys could give, you know, a short introduction about your journey into music and then, yeah, let's get the ball rolling from there. Um, yeah, so I started, um, actually my first job was the Mobiles quite a long, long time ago and then I got into management with an artist by the name of um, Devlin. Get some criminal. Um, actually, that's what I met. I met Amber my first ever publishing meeting. So it's quite ironic they want to panel together. That's mad, you know. Amber was my first publishing yeah, meeting as well. <laughs> and um, so I started. Um, then I had a label at Island Records. I signed. Oh, I'm an indie band by the name of A Wonder because I was, I was bored of rap music, so I decided to do rock music, which I'll never do that ever again. <laughs> um, um, then I signed on um, a YouTuber by the name of KSI. So I did that and then um, from there, I went on to Caroline did distribution and my first signings was Mixtape Madness. <laughs> and, then I, um, and then I went on a bit of a run, I signed on um, D Block Europe, uh, I'm thinking the age, Rema, the list the list goes on. And then I'm recently I started my own company, which is the first I'm I'm with the first black owned distro in Europe. Thank you. And our roster I'm um, and our roster, um, I see one of my staff. Um, Shout out Yara in the cut. Big Yara in Big the up Yara in the cut. Um, and our roster consists of D Block Europe, Scraps, Nines, Digga D, K Trap, Mons Malone. I'm missing someone. There's a, rumor, a there's a rumor going around, but correct me if I'm wrong, because I don't like to give fake news, okay. but you've had the most rap uk rap top 10 albums this year is that true yeah oh. I'm, gl I'm glad you said that not him <laughs> so yeah that's my um that's my short brief history there's a lot more but um yeah sweet all right well, we're gonna come load up the question shortly now on to amber hi um yeah i've been doing music publishing for 20 years now um, I started um, doing work experience at a young age and just worked my way up. Started as an assistant, then went to a song plugger, then A&R manager, the rest is history. So I did 10 years at EMI Publishing that merged with Sony and then I left there and went to Warner Chapel where I just had my 10 year anniversary like last month. So Congrats, that's an amazing accomplishment. <laughs> uh, my journey actually started in a similar room to this. So I did a degree and did a master's in nothing to do with music. My degree was in English Lit, my master's was in Global Literature. And then I had a real job. Um, I was an intern at a company called P&G. I did a week, I realized I hated it. Um, I attended one of these talks and at the time there was Alex Boteng who is um, a president of a record label. There was a woman called Afrie who also now works or used to work at Universal. There was a whole panel with everyone and I remember the woman asked, um, anybody want to work in marketing because I'm looking for an intern? Um, at the time, my P&G job was paying me money. The intern at Universal was shocking. Um, but I begged her for the job. She gave me the job. I did it for a year. Then after that, I was poached by Alec Boteng uh, to go and work in the marketing division at Island Records. That is where I met Colin, so we worked together very briefly. Um, I stayed there for five years, uh, and recently, just this year, I moved to ADA as head of marketing um, across the black music roster. So we've got Nems, we've got Meeks, we've got Tunde, we've got Bugsy, a whole heap of artists. But yeah, that's kind of it. Very and impressive. And we worked together at Island when, um, on Huncho. I'm not gonna lie, Noha used to find me very annoying because I would just ask so many crazy <laughs> yes. questions, but Noha, <laughs> fact, 
But No Heart, yeah, No Heart was amazing on that campaign as well. And to No Heart's credit, actually, Honcho went in there just with a basic belly where we originally went in yes. there. And then No Heart was like, you know what, we got to kind of spin this, make it way more impressive, introduce us to like some theatre company that kind of created a yeah. whole bespoke mask for him. So having a marketer like that work on your campaign can be so helpful in helping you just think outside the box to how far you can kind of really take certain concepts. But without further ado, Mohammed. Hey guys, this is Mohammed. I'm currently the data analyst for Wasserman. Um, my journey in music has been quite different. I started as a producer. Uh, since I was 17, I was producing mainly UK drill music. And I got a few placements, even with Fumes Engineer and stuff like that. And then essentially I got interested in the music business. Uh, so I started as an A&R intern for Universal. I think I worked there for maybe three months. And that's when I realized, okay, this data stuff is quite serious because everyone is using it. So then I started studying data science and that's when I got into the data analytics stuff and started my own business as well. So I started my data agency at software company here in London and eventually I got the job from Wasserman as well and then other companies. And that's literally how I started in the music industry, I think. That's very impressive and I think um, well, a lot of people don't understand the value of data, but in many respects, in this modern climate, data is like oil. So I think I'm going to open up the, the questions in relation to you and Noha. In relation to yourself, if you could give the audience a bit more insight into why data is so valuable in relation to marketing and why it doesn't have to be data over creativity and how they can both complement each other and I guess going back to um, yourself Noha especially considering like the impressive work that you've done with NEMS and you know I believe I read somewhere one of his biggest markets is Germany and his the consumption of his project didn't just fall off a cliff after week one and so on and so forth it would be great to kind of for you to yeah give the audience some insight into how to be effective um, from a marketing standpoint and connect with audiences they have outside of the UK. So yeah, I think data is crucial, especially this, this day and age, because there's a lot of noise. And using data, I think you can kind of like look at the bigger picture, especially even for mainstream artists, I think. Um, just looking at the historic data and looking at what's working for you and what's not. So for example, we did plenty of researches on even mainstream artists and we realized the importance of, let's say, social media and the blogs. So we could essentially look at the number of mentions of that artist over time and how it was correlated with streams. So then again, it kind of like explains if you need streams, you still need to be relevant on social media or like playlisting. So I think data is crucial to understand what blogs are bringing engagement, what influencers are bringing you views, and I think if you don't have data, you're just gonna, it's going to be a guess game. And you're going to spend a lot of money putting behind influencers and blogs that doesn't really work. So I think, yeah, cr data is crucial when you're marketing and also like in terms of strategy. And not just marketing, I would say also brand deals. Because brand deals are quite underrated in the industry, specifically in the UK. But essentially, you could make a lot more money from brand deals rather than streams itself. And then again, that depends on your social presence, that depends on if blogs are talking about you and your personality as well, honestly. And that's so true because you can see artists that might not have the biggest social media profile, they not, might not have the craziest streaming numbers, but they're collecting all of the brand coins. So it is very important, I guess, how you package your data. So it's one thing having the data, and I guess like you're saying, it's another thing to interpret it, strategize with it, and present it to the relevant. Exactly, because obviously you have to see it from the brand's perspective. They might not be as tapped in the music industry as music executives, so they look at your social media. They don't care about the streams because essentially the placement is going to be on Instagram or TikTok or something like that. So essentially, you don't necessarily have to make money from streaming. If you have a good personality um, and you're doing decent on the streaming, but you have a solid fan base on social media, you can get five, six figures brand deals. And that's a lot more than streaming, I would say. That's very, very insightful. Um, there was one thing to do with um, 
brand deals I always used to kind of break my heart because I used to always used to tell myself like oh it's in America they can have a gun on Instagram and still get like a Nike sponsorship in their next post in the UK you have to keep it like squeaky clean for a brand to look at you do you feel I was ignorant in my view or I think not really I feel like a lot of artists and even management are just waiting for brands to reach reach them out and I think it should be the opposite way so if you have a hit song on TikTok you should be making data decks and going to these brands and telling look this guy is popping right now. That's he, his audience is Gen Z, and that's why he's the best fit for your campaign. Because again, brands don't really have time for this. All they do is okay. We have a campaign coming up. Which artist is the best for this campaign? And then there's obviously consultants and all of that. But if you are a manager of an artist, or if you're an artist himself, um, collect your data and create sort of convincing pitch and go to these brands and tell them, look. Most of my audience follow JD Sports. Most of my audience follow Nike. And that's why if you guys are doing a campaign, this guy is the best person for you. And that's essentially how you get brand deals. Very well explained. Noha? Uh, just to firstly touch on the data side, how I use data um, in record label life is easy way is when you tease a track, so the teasing, if you're, gonna, if you're releasing a song and you want to start teasing it on platforms maybe a month before it's coming out, teasing and seeing how well the engagement is on what you're posting out there actually kind of dictates whether that song is going to come out or whether it's not going to come out. Nine times out of ten, we tease maybe four or five tracks. The one that I thought was going to be the hit looks like it's not the hit, and then we curve and we move to the one that seems to be getting the most traction. So I'd say on a day-to-day, -day, that's where I use data kind of to look at what is going to come, and how it's, is going to look at what is going to come. Um, and then on launch, uh, the date you get the first week is really insightful. By that I mean like streaming data, who's consuming, where are they consuming, what country are they consuming in, what age demographic. Um, all of that is super important to kind of let you know how much legs your track has. Is it a song that's gonna, you, you're gonna see growth in like a month, six weeks, two months? Um, or is the song kind of dead, in which case, if we didn't have a track that we needed to come out with, we kind of need to bring it quicker. Um, so yeah, we use data all the time. Uh, but I don't, to your point that you mentioned, data doesn't dictate creative. Data is there to kind of help steer. And how I best describe it is, you've almost got like three or four pieces of your puzzle. The data helps you decide which piece goes when. But those pieces of the puzzle should be the creative stuff. That's the music, that's the videos, that's the content. It's kind of just the data that decides how quickly that stuff comes out. If you kind of can slow it down, or if you need to like keep up with the ammunition, you play those cards quicker. Um, then you asked me about NEMS. And um, just NEMS and our intention to make NEMS, oh, it sounds really cheesy, intention to make NEMS global. But it was a conscious effort, and us being aware of the fact that only 20% 20, 20 of NEMS' streams come from the UK, 80% is ex-UK. So it means that with everything that we do, with everything that he does, we kind of need to look at the UK as like a piece in the puzzle. It's not being on the be all and end all. So if he's not top 10 in the charts here, but he's top 10 on, on Shazam in South Africa, we're doing well. Um, and I'd say it's almost as if for NEMS, what we intentionally try to do is start fires, and not real fires, like metaphoric fires, um, in different countries so that then there was some sort of like appetite, there was a bubble for him, people wanted to consume his music. And then with those fires, it was really easy to see where there was no heat, i.e. France was one of our weakest territories. So now it's like a conscious effort. What are we doing in France? Who are we collaborating with? When is he going out there? Is he going to be at France Fashion Week? What kind of content and video stuff can I be making that feels very French centric? Um, so yeah, thinking and looking at an artist with just one territory in mind is definitely not how it should be done when DSP platforms, social media is, are global. You can see your artist anywhere, whether you're here or in Morocco or in China. So you kind of need to keep that in mind, yeah, with every release, or every I think artist. very important, like you guys defining your metrics of success as Noha has illustrated there. And yeah, having that level of like global ambition and knowing that, um, just knowing where your audience resonates. Um, very similar to a lot of stuff that we said before, the point about um, minimal viable product and kind of just testing first before going gun hole deep and throwing the kitchen sinker song was um, 
a point that I can relate to a lot because a lot of artists are straight away like, let's throw 10K, 5K at YouTube ads, at this and at that, without actually understanding, is this what my audience wants? So For I sure. feel that was a, a very insightful point. And I guess Amber from, I guess a publishing point of view, but also from someone that's built successful teams, what do you, I guess, how do you encourage your teams to like, I guess, leverage data and use that to kind of communicate with their acts that they work with without, you know, encouraging producers or artists to compromise the creative element in what they're doing? Um, I think it's really hard. I think in one hand, you want everyone to win. So it's like, watch the data, see where it's spiking, sign it, get it closed. But on the flip side, I guess I'm still a little bit like, old school and traditional, I think there's something to be said for still following your gut, following your craft. Is it a hit? Is it a banger? Like, maybe the data's not showing that at that particular point, but I think that is the beauty with publishing is you sometimes have a little bit more time for people to develop. And, you know, it, it actually, it, sometimes it's different, I guess, if you're chasing a single down, you're purely looking on the data and what it's doing at that instant moment. But if you're actually looking at a writer thinking, I believe you're going to have cuts with all the following artists in the world, you don't need to be following it. And I, I do still think you should go back to that sort of way of, old school way of doing things in some ways, as, as important as data is. I, I think it's a blend of the both, a blend of the two. So. Agreed, similar, exactly, to, similar to what Noah said, right, mm -hmm. there to complement as opposed to dictate. Mm -hmm. So um, never get rid of your gut instinct or never yeah. ignore your gut instinct. And I guess, you know, moving on to yourself, Colin, um, EJ have been involved in like a host of innovative marketing campaigns such as I guess you know the Mazza track there was like various remixes for that um, but then all the way far as far back as the Air Force One track for which we saw again an innovative remix and it was an innovative breakthrough track as well so I guess yeah from a marketing standpoint what do you encourage um, our young audience here today to kind of look out for or how do you encourage them to kind of navigate how they push their campaigns i think the key is to be uh, i'm as creative as possible and um there's a lot going on in the world like there's youtubers there's there's um love and hip-hop there's a lot of people distracted so i think it's it's been extremely um having a creative point creating some good assets that will last forever. And um, as everyone said on the panel, um, using the data to kind of make some decisions, but don't don't determine, don't do it for the data, still stick to your gut. Because this all comes down, it's all about the music at the end of the day, but the data can determine how to market the music. And I've got like a, an amazing um, squad that know how to um, use the data, but still keep I'm the creative, really good, and when you work with an artist, um, an, an artist like um, Nines, Nines is so focused on his assets, on on the video, on the movie, on I'm just going to shoot a video and just put it just on Instagram, so just to go for my social media. So it's those are the things that stand out, you know, like in terms of um, I'll give another example. Um, Dicker D, you know, he was always about, I'm putting, I'm, I'm starting a trend. I'm going to do things that everyone will follow. So I think it's just being as creative as possible and feeling into the data rather than trying to um, do it for the data. Because I think that's a big problem in the creative. So. And I guess what, it would be great to kind of get you guys' stance on a question I was posed earlier. Um, in this climate, where you've achieved what you achieved in um, UK rap music, what do you say to people that say, you know, UK rap is dead or UK music is in a very, very bad place? It would be good to kind of get, um, yeah, the thoughts and opinions from you all on this matter. I feel like Colin needs to go first on this. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think it's, it's dead. I think it's evolving. I think um, Brother Wiz made some good points earlier on. I, I think, I think we got, everyone got a bit, I don't want to say relaxed or lazy, but complacent. Complacent. I think there's a lot of managers that think they know it all. There's a lot of artists that 
haven't achieved anything, but are so overconfident. Well, one of them ones, they ain't had one single without asking for even, a 200 yeah, bag advance. Madness, like, saying I'm going triple platinum and they ain't put out like a single yet. So I think people got a bit, also I think, I think it became a job. So my 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 mum's nephew's uncle's friend's sister was rapping. You, you know what I mean? I think everybody was rapping because everyone saw it like a hustle rather than it's art, it's talent. But I think it's a double-edged sword because I think last year the biggest rap song in the world was Sprinter. Like we've never had that. There's never been a UK song that's been the biggest rap song in the world, and the biggest and the hottest artist in the world in rap is Central C, where we've never had that. So people like to discredit and say it's going through a bad time. It's just going through an, a different evolution. Like we need new superstars because most of the guys that have done it, they're getting older, but people are still in our arenas and stadiums. Like we've never had that. So it's not as bad as how people make out, but there is a laziness, there's a complacency, there's, there's a lack of people knowing that it's it's 10% creative, 90% work your ass off. And as you come into this industry, you know, from the whole um, A&R process, what advice do you give to a young emerging A&R today? Um, you've got to, it's what you believe in. Don't follow what everyone else is doing. It's what you believe in. Because this is so hard. So if you don't wake up in the morning and, and think about it, don't do it. Because it's that difficult. Like it's not a job, it's a career. It's, it's even a lifestyle, really. So Facts. any young A&R, if you don't love it and don't see a future with it, it's, it's not going to work if you try If you try and force it. Everyone I'm with on the panel is because they love it. You know what I mean? I, I met Amber in 2010. And we're still here, you know what I mean? And that's Straight. because, and that's what it is, because, it's because she loves it and she signed Tiny Temper then and Labyrinth back then. They were going number one, and that's, and that's like 14 years ago. I, you know what? Amber was so modest with her intro, you know? So well, modest. We need to, we, too, we, I, let me do the intro, to be yeah. fair. But <laughs> it's just, um, yeah, it's just if you don't love it, because it is a lot of work, it's, it's, not, it's not the parties and the Brits that you see us all dressed up, it's, it's waking up seven in the morning, getting phone calls, three in the morning, people shouting at you, people screaming at you, people telling you that their dog hasn't eaten, or it's all sorts of madness. So if you can't deal with that, then you shouldn't be in the industry because it is a lot of work. So you have to love it. That's facts, that's facts. Um, yeah, there's a lot of, it's just, that's just bringing on a lot of memories because Colin definitely used to have me in that Caroline building it was grilling me about the performance of tracks and so on and so forth. So he's definitely not joking when he says that you have to wake up and literally breathe, you know, m your passion for music. And if you do apply for that internship <laughs> and you contradict what you just said, then obviously you're going to know why you're not going to get a response. But... Um, Going back to, I guess, yourself, Amber, how would you answer that question? And I think to also answer that, it would be really good for you to kind of touch on some of the successes you had to help illustrate, you know, why those particular clients you worked with reached that level. Yeah, I, it's really tough because it does feel really difficult at the moment, but I sort of hold on to the fact that I think music is cyclical, you know, um, and it will come back around. It's just a matter of time and when. And as Colin was saying, you know, the success that happened with Dave and Sprinter and Central C, you know, I think that came out at a time when no one was expecting that to happen. Um, I remember many years ago when I signed Tiny Tempers Publishing, I was really, I was really worried. He had this tune, Wifey Rhythm, I think it was, and that was what was there. And I just thought. He's a great pop star, but I remember thinking, oh, but there's Tinchy Strider. There's only room for one, you know, there's no way. And lo and behold, he was signed and then did pass out. And, you know, it, the rest is history, but it just goes to show if great music, you're only one song away, you're only one hit song away from your whole life changing and your whole trajectory and project completely changing, you know, and, yeah, I, I hope it's all going to come full circle again, but I, I think it just goes to show you, there's always room for more than one, just like that. Suddenly people 
you know, will come to the forefront again. So I don't want to give and up I get just so that the audience are aware as well, because you know, similar to what the other guests have mentioned before, you don't just look within the UK. Um, no. So could you kind of just embellish upon some of the inter international work that you've done? Yeah, um, I mean, in publishing, you know. At Warner Chapel, we've got offices all around the world. Um, I think we genuinely, we are a slightly smaller publisher, so we genuinely try to be aligned with all our other territories, and we have to be, you know, and that's where I think Susie, who was talking earlier on the panel, um, was saying, you know, we put on these writing camps left, right, and centre. We did one in Vegas, um, and off the back of that came Miley Cyrus Flowers, and I think it's just about... Guys, really. let's not leave that without a round of applause. <laughs> no, I wasn't She me. just said they did a writing <laughs> camp in Vegas. But, you know, that came out of a writing camp, and I think... You know, I remember many years ago, you know, Rihanna was making whatever album it was, and it was, I remember Jay Brown being like, you guys have got this dubstep thing here, and it was all about Benga and Scream, and did they have any tracks for Rihanna? And, you know, it, I think people want what's hot, and I think that's where Central C was really smart. He made sure he got with the hottest producer in each territory. So in each territory, he, he had a footprint you know which I think is going back to what you were saying as well which was so spot on you know it's about adding the pieces to the puzzle or which seeing which territories you're breaking in and where you need help and you know we've got a really we've got a great relationship for example with our French office they were like Ali Nakamura she's massive here who could we get to feature on something in the UK you know sent it to Stormzy and then off the back of that came one of their songs and you know it's Insane. you've just got to it's it's really important just because it's a territory we might not know the in, cross collaboration is just so key to, to breaking you around the world did I even answer your question? I don't you know. did 100% you did you went up and above it still. that's an A star star and I guess Noha I'll bring the question to you but I'm going to kind of pivot a bit slightly because we have seen kind of um artists have this we've we've been in an era where we've seen a lot of artists have songs that are bigger than them right so we'll know the tiktok sound before we know that artist and i feel that nems is one of those artists that went against that grain so he came up in that generation but he proved he's more than just like a let's say um a one a one track wonder as it were he's kind of broken that mold built his own identity and built his audience fan base so um i guess yeah, redirecting the, the question to you in a sense whereby how do you how would you encourage an artist emerging today to kind of um that has that moment where they've got a big song but they're not really truly recognised, how do you encourage them to kind of build that audience? Um firstly it's actually about sometimes being aware that your song is bigger than you and not letting that impact you negatively. When I first started at ADA, where NEMS was signed, um, I remember they saying, I know your song, I don't know what you look like. Mm. So I've known the track, I hear it on TikTok, I've heard it on Spotify, but I, if you put pictures of 10, 10 20 year old guys, I wouldn't know who you were. Um, whereas now, I'd like to think if I did have a picture of 10 kids, I'd know who NEMS was. Um, so it's conscious efforts. It's like knowing that that is a, a weakness, but also then putting the steps in place to make that not be a weakness, i.e. from small things, i.e. your artwork, making sure that initially his artwork was very kind of font and graphics and less of him, making a conscious effort that he's front and center on some of that stuff, making sure the first kind of 20 seconds of his music videos, you see his face and it's, he's got a beautiful face and you see it and you like focus on it, making sure that the content that we're posting on TikTok is very much him, him doing his thing before he then does any challenge or he then does any activity. Um, even the assets that we serve, the, the assets that we do as sponsored ads, making sure that you see him, you hear him, you hear his voice, you clock that he's from Manny, then the song kicks in. It was a real conscious effort to kind of marry how big his music was to how big his face kind of is now. Um, it's definitely a thing. There are a lot of artists that have songs that are bigger than them, but it's not, I wouldn't take that as a negative. It just means that your music is popping and now you need to get your face out there. Um, so yeah, don't see it as a negative. Try to just catch up to where your sonic already is. Um, I'd be more worried if I had an artist that everybody knew their face, but didn't have a clue what the track was. That's when you probably kind of don't have an artist, you just have a, a model, so. <laughs> fair <laughs> <Yeah>. enough. <laughs> fair play, fair play. 
and Mohammed, from your point of view, I guess, how do you look at the industry now from a data point of view? And what are some of the key things, I guess, our audience need to be aware of in relation to the live perspective of music? Yeah, so I think the music industry is going to be more and more numbers driven, data driven, because again, you have a lot of pressure from stakeholders in terms of returns and all that kind of stuff. But as everyone said, don't let it dictate your creativity as well. Um, use data to make decisions in terms of marketing because essentially the whole point of data is to save you money on the marketing, I would say, uh, in simple terms. So if you are looking for, if you have a sound similar to NEMS, use data to understand, okay, what blogs are pushing NEMS, what kind of niches are pushes, uh, pushing his sound, basically. Is it football niches? Is it something else? And I think being data-driven, even as an independent artist, I think it's going to be crucial because you're c competing against like big labels and, again, big res resources and stuff. So uh, yeah, I think it's going to be heavily data-driven, but at the same time, uh, you still need to be creative, um, even if you're independent. And I guess because you're part of Wasserman, how does that feed in from a live perspective? So again, even on the live side, I think that's quite crucial because in terms of touring, data is the main thing. So essentially, where do you want to have concerts where you're going to even do a brand deal, as I said? That really depends on the demographic of your fan base. So essentially, if you're popping in, let's say, Europe, in Germany specifically, we're going to look at the data and then decide, okay, which venue should we go for? which city has the most audience in terms of your fan base. So I think in terms of touring, 100%, like data is the main thing to be able to to be profitable, basically. So and have you seen a connection between, I guess, when artists perform live and I guess how the wider brand reach seems to stretch? 100%. I, th I feel like you need to be active on both perspectives, like streaming, socials, and also festivals. Because essentially, um, I think there was a great example was H, uh, when he took out the Manchester United kit on, I think it was Glastonbury. So he had a lot of mentions be just because of that specific PR stunt. And we were looking at the data and even the number of streams for H were actually correlated with those mentions. So it's quite interesting how performing on stage could actually lead to more streams or even more free PR, I would say, because a lot of blogs are talking about your performance and I think that's free marketing for you, honestly. Yeah, thank you very, very much. That's much appreciated. And I think in terms of the live perspective, a lot of artists sometimes kind of skip the early stages, you know, performing in front of 100 people, then building up to 1,000, and then, you know, then you get to your kind of headline festivals. Could you, is it worth kind of reminding how you know, it's still important to kind of build that side of your career? 100%. I, th I feel like it's the process. You have to perform in front of 10 people first. And at the end of the day, that's data. Like, you understand who's your audience, who's actually willing to pay to see you. And then you kind of, like, replicate this and you kind of, like, scale it and you target the same audience or maybe similar audiences. Uh, so, yeah, essentially, that's part of the process. You can't really skip uh, performing in front of 10 or 100 people and just expect to perform at a wireless. So... Yeah. Thank you very much. That's much appreciated.